Good morning, Australia. My name is Rob Mueller. I'm a senior technologist at uh, NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. I'm very happy to be here and uh, it's a privilege to be presenting to you. Thank you for inviting me. And today's topic is behavior of lunar simulants in reduced gravity flights. And so uh, specifically I'd like to talk to you about an experiment that NASA did. Uh, it's called a Roxygen Reactor. It's an ISRU reactor. ISRU means in situ resource utilization or living off the land in space. And so I'd like to talk to you about an experiment we did on the reduced gravity flight which flies out of Ellington Field in Houston, Texas. Next chart please. So today's presentation will be about ISRU oxygen production. Uh, we'll talk about the Roxygen system which NASA developed as a prototype to prove that we can actually do this. Then we'll talk about the specific subsystem, the regolith feed system, which is interesting to us as space miners. We're very interested in how the regolith behaves. And uh, what you do with the regolith is really what this talk is all about. And what we discovered is that the regolith input hopper design was uh, very sensitive to reduced gravity and gravity changes. This is a parameter that's difficult to predict, but we were able to uh, do some experiments. The experiments used three kinds of regular simulants, uh, which I'm sure you know all about after uh, Dr. Laurent Sibille uh, presented the different kinds of simulants to you. We'll talk about using these simulants in a reduced gravity flight. And then uh, also we, we did some opportunistic testing, and I'll, I'll talk about the different techniques that we used uh, to uh, determine the behavior of the regular simulant. And then after that we'll talk about what the effects of reduced gravity were on the flow of the simulant in the hopper and some conclusions followed by maybe five minutes of question and answer which I, I hope to do live with you after this video is over. Next chart please. So first of all let's talk about in situ resource utilization and oxygen production. Uh, the reason we do ISRU primarily is to cut the bonds to earth. There's a massive logistics train that's required to go from the earth to the moon or Mars or an asteroid and it's simply too expensive. Okay, so SpaceX today, the very uh, most economical expendable launch vehicle on the market charges four thousand dollars per kilogram to get into space. That's still very expensive. When you see a rocket launching, ninety percent of the mass of that rocket is propellant. So by making propellant in space, mission consumable production, we can eliminate 90% of the mass of the rocket simply by making it at the actual location. Now the beauty of ISRU is that we have everything. We have everything we need on the moon. We just have to process it so that we can make it into a form that is actually useful to us. So the four typical things that are usually mentioned about ISRU is we can make oxygen and recently the Elcross mission has shown that there's water at the lunar poles as well. There's plenty of water on Mars, we know that, and there's probably water on asteroids too. So water is really the uh, missing link for space exploration. If we have water, we can make hydrogen and oxygen by electrolyzing it. And we can also uh, make oxygen out of the regolith. Even if we don't have water, let's say you're at the equatorial regions of the moon, uh, where there is no water ice, most likely, then you can still scoop up the regolith, mine the regolith, and use various techniques to extract the oxygen from the regolith itself. Uh, we also would use this for life support and fuel cell power consumables, gases, consumable gases for science and cleaning, but the most important one is the propellant production because this has a chance to make space flight economical. Space transportation can be revolutionized by making the propellants at your destination. Next chart, please. So how do we do this? Well, over the last 30 years, the chemical engineers and the researchers in the space sector and, and uh, other industries have come up with different ways of uh, uh, extracting oxygen from lunar regolith. And so numerous chemistries have been proposed and studied since the Apollo missions. And here's a list of all the various types of uh, chemical reactions that can extract oxygen from regolith. Now the one we're going to talk about today is hydrogen reduction of ilmenite. Ilmenite is FeTiO3 and it's, it has iron oxide in it. And so we can reduce that and get uh, oxygen out of the ilmenite which is a component of the lunar regolith. Next chart. So uh, roxygen is a 
prototype. It's a prototype reactor using a hydrogen reduction system that NASA developed. And the whole point of this was to raise the technology readiness level. So we always start with very simple prototypes and we increase the fidelity from TRL 2, 1 or 2, all the way through 6. When we reach TRL 6, technology readiness level 6, it's ready for flight, it's ready for mission. Technology readiness level 9 means it's actually been flown and proven in space on a real mission. So this is the Roxygen reactor. We have some photos here that show the different subsystems. So basically this is what happens. You have a small excavator and that's your mining machine. The excavator acquires the regolith and it's mobile. Once it acquires the regolith, in this particular case it drives up the ramp and there's a hopper here. The regolith is deposited into the hopper and then we have a, an auger screw feed that raises the regolith up here and flows it down through this chute here and there's a valve here, a regolith valve, which is a very tough thing to do to keep a valve uh, sealed in vacuum with regolith dust on it. So we develop techniques to keep that valve clean. Uh, and then we flow the regolith into this cylindrical reactor here. And then there's a variety of uh, chemical processing uh, subsystems here that uh, pressurize the cylinder with hydrogen and then react the regolith with hydrogen, heat it up to about 900 Celsius, and then the result is water vapor is expelled from the regolith. You capture the water vapor by condensing it, and then once you've condensed it, you, you uh, uh, actually clean up that water and you electrolyze it, and, and once you've electrolyzed it, you have hydrogen oxygen, which you store in these pressure vessels over here. Next chart, please. So let's focus in on one piece of the Roxygen prototype, the Roxygen mission. So here's the regolith feed system. Our task was to get regolith into the reactor. So the chemical engineer said, here's our reactor, it's this symbol, uh, uh, cylinder here. And they said, we need regolith to come from the lunar surface and be deposited into this reactor and then it needs to be expelled from the reactor again, so it's a batch processing. And every time the batch uh, is, is processed, it has to be regenerated and a new batch comes in and that way we incrementally through many batches build up uh, to our mission goal which is about a thousand kilograms of uh, consumables. So we have the input hopper here, we have an auger screw feed here, then it flows down through a valve into the reactor. The reactor actually has a shaft here with a motor on the top of the shaft and the shaft turns a, a mixer inside the reactor because what happens when you heat the regolith to about 900 C is it starts sintering and it has the consistency of a sugar cube so it's not a complete solid but it's just solid enough sintered so that it would never come out of the end of the reactor again so our task was to put it into this hopper but the next question was will it flow in the hopper so next chart please so I'd like to show you a very quick video of a prototype we built. This is a Lexan model so we can visualize it through the Lexan and we'll play a video here of how the regolith flows in 1G on Earth. And you can see that it, it's, it's not a smooth flow. I would call this a cascading avalanche flow. And the reason why is because the, the regolith is very cohesive. And so you can see that it's actually not flowing but these shear planes are developing and the shear planes are avalanching. So it's actually not very good flow. It's adequate and we thought it was good enough for our mission, but we were concerned because when you have this avalanching and this shearing happening, that's a result of the, the forces from the gravity. Now if the, if the reduction in gravity happened, then would those forces diminish and would the avalanching and cascading stop? That was the question. So next chart. So we decided that we had to do some risk reduction activities. And uh, the only way to really do this, uh, there's two ways. There's analytically or experimentally. And Analy analytically is very difficult. It probably requires many supercomputers to uh, do discrete Elman modeling and, and model every little grain of regolith. It's just too computationally intensive. So the, the logical thing to do is to go on a reduced gravity flight, a parabolic flight, where we can simulate reduced gravity at 1 6 G, 1 3rd G, and, and even 0 G. And so that's what we did. And we built a, a simple experiment. This requires no power, no motors, nothing. It's simply the hopper in a symmetrical configuration, kind of a mirror image, 
and we call this an hourglass. So it's a hopper shaped like an hourglass. And by flipping this over, you can actually run the experiment uh, in successive parabolas. Now remember, each parabola lasts 20 seconds, and then you have to reset your experiments, then you get another 20 seconds to, to run your experiment. And so one side had uh, uh, veins in it, which uh, we, we had uh, for uh, heat transfer. We were thinking about using heat transfer veins, and the other side of the hourglass hopper did not have any veins in it. That's the difference. Let's go to the next chart. And so here you can see uh, the Van Townsend and I, my co-author, uh, are actually uh, operating the experiment. And we'll, we'd like to show you a quick video of, of how it works when you operate it. So let's, let's take a look at the video. This is uh, the reduced gravity flight. That's myself here. And then we flip it over. All the regulars is in the top half. Now look at this tube. Look very closely at this tube here. Because you can see that the flow is very slow. It's intermittent. And there's a certain hang time. The regolith has a hang time. It doesn't flow like it does in 1G. And so what we discovered was it actually didn't flow very well in 1.6 G, even though you saw in the previous video, video it, it did flow quite well in 1G. So we use the hammer technique. We, we have a mallet and we actually just tap the hopper with a hammer. And uh, that seems to work. So by putting some percussion in, uh, then you have a dynamic effect and that causes the regolith to flow. So we took advantage of being on this reduced gravity flight and we didn't really have the answers going into the flight, but we decided to experiment. So we had a variety of techniques. We used a hammer. We actually took the whole hopper and moved it up and down. We bounced it up and down. We shook it sideways. And we had a, 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 some combined techniques where we hit it with a hammer and we were shaking it. So let's go back to the presentation. So the, the point is, is that we, we learn by experimenting and by being in a relevant environment such a, as a reduced gravity flight, we have the freedom to experiment. And I can tell you, we learned more in that reduced gravity flight than we did in six months of discussions in, in the conference rooms. So next, uh, next chart, please. Here, here's the, the actual results. And you can see that it's, it's nonlinear. And actually, as you come down in gravity, in gravitational force here, so one-third g is here, one-sixth g is here, and you can see a radical difference where the time of flowing, it's actually six times longer in, in, in up here than it is in one g. And, and that uh, uh, needs some more studying on exactly why that happens. But you can see that the reduced gravity flight uh, it shows that the reduced gravity is um, different and it flows much slower. So imagine you're on the moon and you, you mine your regolith, you put it in the hopper and you're waiting to process it so you can make propellant, so you can maybe come home with that propellant and suddenly it doesn't work. And it doesn't work because the regolith is not flowing through the hopper so it never makes it into the reactor. That could be a problem. That's what we say. We say that's game over. So we cannot risk that. And so we have to develop new techniques to make this regolith flow. And what we found is that the JSC-1A, which is our standard lunar regolith simulant, did flow, but it flowed intermittently. And we had to use the hammer technique to get it to flow. But we were able to make it flow. So that was good news. So let's go to the next chart. Then we use a different simulant, NULHT-2M. This is a lunar highlands type simulant developed uh, at NASA. And uh, we, we had some very erratic data. That's why you can hardly see anything on the chart here. Very difficult to uh, get this kind of data in 20 seconds because actually uh, the, the time of flow was, was longer than 20 seconds. So we had to piece it together from various 20 second parabolas. Wasn't very good. But what we did discover was that NULHT-2M, because it has agglutinates in it and has different mineralogy, it behaves differently and it does not flow. And it absolutely the only way we could get it to flow was actually by hitting it hard with a, a mallet or by bouncing it up and down and shaking it side to side. So by dynamically inducing forces into the regolith, you break up the, the shear planes and it starts flowing. Uh, so that's, that's actually a, a successful method, but it's, it's uh, highly experimental. So let's go to the next chart, please. Then OB1, this is developed by NORCAT in Canada, and it's also a uh, lunar regolith simulant, uh, more of a, a Mare type, I believe. Uh, they have uh, Kenobi, which is more, more of a highland type. Uh, and so this 
uh, simulant also, it's similar to the NULHT-2M simulant in that it has um, these uh, agglutinates in it and so it was also very difficult for this to flow. And uh, we had to use these techniques like shaking it, bouncing it, and using the hammer as well. So the, the key point I'm trying to make is that regolith in reduced gravity does not flow like it does in 1G on Earth and new techniques will have to be developed to make it flow. Next chart. So this is just an overview of the test we did with the Roxygen system. And uh, this is the Mauna Kea Wahine Valley in, in Hawaii on the big island of Hawaii. And you can see this is the, the test site at the bottom of the valley. All the volcanic ash has washed down off the sides of the volcano and, and settled into the valley here. So the valley has a deep pile of volcanic ash which is similar to the basalt powder that we find on the moon which is the lunar regolith. So next chart. This is a picture of the actual physical uh, prototype of the Roxygen reactor. We have two reactors and they work in tandem. And then we have a ramp and we have a small excavator. The excavator mines the regolith, brings up the ramp, deposits it in the hopper, and this actually creates the oxygen from the regolith. Our goal was to make 1,000 kilograms per year and this reactor, it, the scale of this reactor could make about 660 kilograms per year. So this is a two-thirds size scale reactor. Next chart. So in conclusion, uh, the JSC-1A, OB-1, and NULHT-2M simulants that flow through the Roxygen hopper all behave differently. And so this is uh, an important point because our success will depend on, on how well we predict the behavior of the regolith on different planetary bodies. If we don't have good simulants and good test conditions, we may arrive at the wrong conclusions and get a surprise when we arrive at our destination. We don't want any surprises, so we have to find new ways of testing and developing regular simulants that are high fidelity for this kind of work. JSC-1A flow was intermittent but acceptable with the tapping of the hammer uh, at all G levels tested, so JSC-1A did work. However, OB-1 and NULHT-2M did not work. It did not flow and uh, more aggressive bouncing techniques, about three hertz bouncing up and down was required to make it flow. So that was a surprise to us and, and we'll have to develop new techniques to deal with this. Uh, the reduced gravity flight was very useful in accelerating development and discovering items needing improvement. So in one reduced gravity flight, all our questions were answered in terms of we knew we had to make a change to that hopper design. Uh, also, uh, the opportunistic experiments on board the flight, uh, having the human in the loop and being able to uh, try new things, maybe sometimes uh, they're a little serendipitous, but uh, you learn a lot just by trying different things, and that's what we did on the reduced gravity flight, uh, and uh, that was very valuable. Uh, so the uh, av availability of these various si simulants were due to collaborations, uh, and all these simulants have been developed by different groups around the world, and so this is another important point I'd like to make is that collaboration is very important. We're very interested in the Australian uh, lunar regular simulant and other simulants that are being developed in Australia. We know that Australia has a very rich heritage in mining and so we're very uh, happy to be collaborating with the Australian uh, community and uh, we think that will lead to further successes in this field. And uh, in our lab here at the Granular Mechanics Regolith Operations Lab, which is in the Kennedy Space Center Swamp Works, uh, we're trying to develop new techniques and new ways of dealing with uh, regolith from all destinations, Moon, Mars, and asteroids. And our job is to come up with solutions and have the answers ready when NASA uh, decides to fly these missions. That's all I have. Uh, now we'll go to the question and answers and we'll try to do that live. Thank you for your attention.